Welcome back to Close Up. He's been a progressive fighter for education funding for decades, and he's served as an executive counselor since 2016. Now he's running for governor in this election season, unfolding amid a pandemic. Counselor Andrew Valinsky is our guest this morning. Thanks for joining us, Counselor. Oh, good morning, Adam. Nice to join you by Skype. Yeah. So this new remote model of campaigning, is it a blessing or a curse for an outsider progressive candidate like you? Both. So I am I'm able to visit places that I might not be able to drive to just because of the time. Um, but I'm also uh, not able to shake hands and meet in person. And, you know, for someone who likes personal contact, who's comfortable with people, that that's a shortcoming in this uh, in this time. But look, we all adjust to it if that's the worst thing that happens to me that that's not very bad i'm i'm more worried about people who are food insecure worried about their housing things of that nature the troubles of campaigning really pale by comparison i hear you on that one do you think though that your primary opponent's money advantage is blunted in any way by this reality or are you worried about that deficit that you face well we smashed all of the fundraising efforts in terms of number of contributors. Uh, we're double my primary opponent, but we have more contributors, 8,300 now, than anyone else has had all the way through the primary and general cycles. So we're really doing that people-focused, people-powered campaign with lots of small donors. I'm real happy with that approach. Uh, that was very intentional. We never took corporate PAC money. We never exploited the LLC loophole. Uh, we don't take fossil fuel money. So we really count on our friends, our neighbors, people who believe as we do to support our campaign. And, and our numbers show that. Is that going to be a point of contrast moving forward, do you think, with Senator Feltis as you get out there virtually campaigning? Um, it's, it's already been a point of comp contrast. Uh, he's taken a very different approach. Uh, he took the corporate PAC money and then the, the LLC money and then had to give it back. I, I've known where I stand on those issues from the very start. And some of it comes from why I'm running, right? So uh, you mentioned in your intro that I was the Claremont School Funding lawyer. I've been working on school funding and improving the quality of schools for 30 years. And, and that's a very personal effort on my behalf. I came from eastern Pennsylvania and went to school in a mill town where the mill failed. So when I went to Claremont, it was like going home. My dad was a mechanic and a maintenance man, my mom a homemaker. I'm the only one in my family to go to college. Uh, I paid for law school as by working as a carpenter. Um, so I have a very different background. I understand the importance of the educational opportunities, and I want that for everyone in our state, not those who just happen to live in the very wealthy communities. And, and let, let me say, if I, if I can add this, I am very proud that our son Josh is a middle school science teacher. Our daughter Molly, who's a private practice clinical social worker, worked for five years as a high school social worker. Uh, she did it in Harlem. Uh, we have a third daughter who uh, uh, works in a tech startup, not in the school system. But education is very important in my family. And my wife, Amy, and I, we've lived here 38 years. And through 30 of those years, I've worked on improving schools. Uh, so it's a lifelong commitment. It is the primary reason uh, why I'm running for governor. We'll circle back to that education issue in a minute. But how would the state's response to the COVID-19 pandemic differ under a Valensky administration? So first, we would be public health data driven. Um, I wouldn't be listening to Mike Pence. We would be wearing masks when in enclosed places in public because that is the best protection against a second wave, a big flare like we're seeing in Florida and Texas and Georgia. Um, this is not only a public health issue, it's an economic issue. I don't want us to be locked down any longer than we have to be. We have to get people back to work. We have to get businesses operating. And the more safely we work on the pandemic, the less the economic distress will be. 
and that falls mostly on working people. And so I'm, I've confronted the governor on this. Why won't you issue a requirement that people wear a mask? And he told me directly that the public health data does not support that. That is not true. That is a little like the climate change deniers denying the climate change science. Public health shows us that just the simple wearing of a facial covering can cut down the spread of the, of the virus, and we need to do that. So how would you enforce mandatory mask wearing? What would be a potential penalty for those that choose not to? Yeah, I think you go too quickly to penalty, Adam. I think the issue is modeling the good behavior, encouraging more caring for our neighbors and less focus on whether it's a little uncomfortable or a little embarrassing for me to wear a mask. I think the governor has an important role in that regard, and we should focus there. In places where the governors have come out and said, please, for the sake of your neighbor's health, wear a mask, more people do it. But of course, Governor Sununu has said that. He just hasn't gone so far as to make it mandatory. He, yeah, so he's trying to have it both ways. You make important things like that mandatory. You enforce it through businesses. If you want to shop in my store, you should wear a mask to come in. If you want me to serve you behind the lunch counter, I have to wear a mask. Those are fairly basic things. We're not talking about putting people in jail. We're talking about building the community spirit that recognizes we're all in this together. So you're not taking the pledge against uh, broad-based taxes, but you're also doing your own pledge to lower property taxes for the majority of Granite Staters. Explain how you would do that as governor. Yeah, so we filed last Friday and we unveiled a pledge to reduce property taxes for the majority of New Hampshire residents. And we did that specifically because under Governor Sununu, property taxes have gone up $320 million. That's more than when we came out of the, the 2008 recession. The state legislature and the governor has perfected the art of avoiding their own responsibilities and foisting everything on the local property taxpayer. So you start to address this by making sure people understand that. It doesn't always have to happen this way. We are in a pandemic that will create a new normal in terms of it, our economy. Businesses are telling me that they're gonna rely less and less on real estate, on offices, on a physical environment. That's gonna drive down the value of real estate in our state. And if you are only and solely relying on real estate taxes, that's gonna make that reliance more and more difficult. So look, we have people who have to pay their property taxes in two weeks and don't have jobs or have jobs and have half the income. We need to address that problem. And you start by raising the issue. You then go to the issue of everyone having to pay their fair share. Mitt Romney has a beautiful $10 million mansion on the lake in Moultonboro or in Wolfboro. He pays $6 a thousand for his school taxes. My friends in Claremont and Rochester and Berlin and Manchester pay double, triple, five times that amount. All of those communities are struggling, while those who can afford to live on the lake in a couple of communities do really well. This has to be uh, a system where everyone contributes. This is a time when we need to recognize we're all in this together. We need to address New Hampshire's pre-COVID problem of being the quickest aging state in the nation the state that contributes the least to public K-12 schools and the least again to colleges and universities. That's driving young people out of our state. And it's showing up in places like Manchester where you are now. Manchester businesses had to come together to form Manchester Proud to buck up and support the Manchester schools because Manchester spends less on its schools than any other community in the state. 
and I'm afraid it shows. So that's the big problem that we need to deal with. The other problem we need to deal with, and we lose it because of the pandemics being in our face, we lose the climate change issue. And that is why I've fought so hard to prevent a pipeline from being built in the seacoast to Manchester area. I'm the only candidate who opposes that pipeline. That's why I was endorsed by the Sierra Club, the Youth Climate Strike, Ben and Jerry. This is pretty cool, Adam. Ben and Jerry are naming an ice cream after me. Uh, it's called Valinsky's Courageous Crunch. <laughs> That'll be interesting. We'll have to try that one out. We want to sneak in one last question here before we go. Yep. Uh, the last executive council meeting, you led the Democratic opposition to a, a nominee from the governor to the Board of Education, a young black man named Ryan Terrell. You made the case that he doesn't have the experience necessary to serve on the board, but you also used a word, uh, you know, opposing him, his nomination, uh, referring to his nomination as, quote, tokenism. Do you regret using that word? Absolutely. But this is one in a series of cynical moves by our governor to nominate people with really important responsibilities who not only don't have any prior experience, have not shown any commitment to the function of that agency. So Sununu did that with Frank Edelblue, who's trying to take apart public education in New Hampshire by transferring public money to private schools. He did that with Peter Kajoski, who when I asked him about his environmental services job, which is what he was up for, what do you think about climate change? He said, I don't know, I've only been thinking about it for a week. He did it with Gordon McDonald, who has no experience as a judge, but wants to re remove the protections for reproductive rights of people in our state, and he's done it with Ryan Terrell, who's never even volunteered in a school, never volunteered and didn't become interested in the state board until a month ago, according to what he told me. Now, that is not what we need on our state board of education. All right, there Counselor, unfortunately, we've hit the limit of our time here. Uh, we're going to continue this conversation and other stories. We do appreciate you being with us here on Close Up. Adam, take good care. Be safe.